Well, welcome back to Bio 180. Today, we are going to be talking about oxidation reduction reactions as part of cell respiration. So, over the last couple lectures, we have been talking about metabolism in general. So that's our unit. And then we've been talking about free energy. And we've been talking about enzymes and energies of activation and catalysis. And so now we're going to actually start getting into some of our pathways as we talk about cellular respiration. And in cell respiration, we're going to be going over glycolysis. We're going to be going over the citric acid cycle, the electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation. But we're going to give you a little bit of an overview today. And an important part of cell respiration has to do with two uh, really key molecules or processes. And one of them is ATP and its recycling. And then the other is NADH. And NADH involves a type of reaction that's very common in cell respiration called an oxidation reduction reaction. And so we're going to finish up the day talking a little bit about oxidation and reduction. So let's start. We're now moving into these examples of metabolism. And so we're going to go over the cell respiration pathway. And we're going to be spending a day approximately on the major parts of this. And so let's just do an overview, what I call a black box overview. We'll go into a lot of these processes in more detail. But for cell respiration, we'll write that up here. Overall, cell respiration is going to be the conversion of glucose. So we've got C6, H12O6. And then we're going to add oxygen to that. And those are two reactants. And then we're going to produce CO2 and water. And we're going to end up needing about six of those, six of those, and six of those to form our balanced equation. And so overall, this is the pathway for cell respiration. And out of cell respiration, what we get out of this, we're not trying to make CO2 or water. Those are just naturally things that come out of it. We're really trying to get energy. And that energy is going to come to us in the form of ATP. And then we're going to be able to use that ATP in all our other cell processes. So that's the overall process. But the steps of cell respiration start. So we're going to start our glucose with glucose over here. And the first step that happens is that that glucose is going to enter into a process called glycolysis. And on the other side of glycolysis, we're going to get a molecule coming out called pyruvate. That's kind of the main reaction. We've got glucose going in, pyruvate coming out. We've got kind of this, I refer to it as a black box bunch of different chemical reactions happening in there. There are some other things that are going to come into glycolysis as well, and these will be important for us. So first, we're going to have some ATP coming into glycolysis at the beginning of it, and that's going to produce some ADP. We'll talk more about that later. And then on the back end, we have some ATP coming out. So we actually have some ADP coming in. And we're going to have some ATP coming out. And this is the main thing that we're interested in, is we're going to get some ATP coming out of it. 
We actually can put two and two, uh, four, and then we'll get four ATP out of it. There's also another molecule that starts to come into this and is going to play a big role, and that is a molecule called NAD plus is going to come in. We'll have a couple of NAD pluses come in, and they result in NADH is coming out as a product. So here's our main reaction. And then we have some other cofactors and coenzymes, we call them, coming in and, that, in and out of that reaction with NADH and ATP being the main ones that are going to come out. The pyruvate, now as we follow, we're not done with cell respiration. That's just the first part of it. The pyruvate from this step actually has two places it can go it can enter into another process that we call pyruvate transport. And if we involve it in pyruvate transport, then we get a molecule coming out this side called acetyl-CoA, where CoA is an enzyme. We'll learn more about these processes and steps as we go through. Now, up here, some things that come in, just like we had in glycolysis, we have some things that come in. We have another NAD plus that comes in, and so we get NAD H out. We also are going to have some carbon dioxide. This is where we get our first carbon dioxide production is in pyruvate transport. So we're going to have some CO2 come out. And we also have right here, notice we have this CoA that stands for coenzyme A. It wasn't present on pyruvate. It is present in acetyl Away, and so we have this cofactor called coenzyme A that's going to come in there. Uh, and so that's going to be it for pyruvate transport. There's another place, though, that pyruvate can go, and that is called fermentation. Okay, so when pyruvate enters fermentation, then the real point of it, there's a couple ways. Fermentation has two pathways that come off of it. So fermentation can produce acetaldehyde and ethanol. And then it can also produce a molecule called lactate. And which one you produce, whether it's ethanol or lactate, really just depends on uh, which pathway you have. Humans and other mammals have a lactate pathway. Yeast and uh, microorganisms uh, often have an ethanol producing. So this is alcohol. So when yeasts do fermentation, this is where they're producing the alcohol that we find in wine and beer uh, and bread, actually, CO2. So concurrent with this, we also release CO2. But either way we do it, a key for fermentation is that we take this molecule of NADH and we produce more NAD+. And then this NAD plus goes back up to rerun glycolysis. The key here, so which pathway? Pyruvate. Do we go to pyruvate transport or do we go to fermentation? The key is oxygen. If we have no oxygen, no O2, then we go into fermentation. And if we have oxygen, then we go to pyruvate transport. So that's how we start. Now, acetyl-CoA. We're still continuing with cell respiration. The next part, the next process, is a pathway called the citric 
acid cycle. And so acetyl-CoA is actually going to enter into the citric acid cycle. And in the citric acid cycle, a couple things happen. On this side, we are going to release some more carbon dioxide. So again, we're looking at this part of the equation and that CO2. So, so far in this equation, we saw we started with glucose. And now we're really producing our CO2s. So it's in the Krebs cycle and pyruvate transport that we're starting to produce the, the CO2s in the product. The other thing that we produce from the citric acid cycle is a lot of this molecule of NADH. So over here, we have a lot of NAD plus going into it, and then that's being used in the citric acid cycle to produce NADH again. We also produce another coenzyme called FADH2. So we need to have some FAD plus put in there. So these are going to come in. And then we have FADH2 and NADH. For every acetyl-CoA that goes in, we produce three of these, one of those. We also, during citric acid cycle, produce some ATP. Now remember, that was our focus, is producing ATP. That's going to be the energy that we get out of this whole process. So we had a couple come here. We get a couple coming from here. Uh, but our final story, there's one more step. And it involves these coenzymes. We call these reduced coenzymes. And this is going to be the next step in our story because those are going to enter into a final process called the electron transport chain. And so NADH and FADH2 are really, we'll go over this, we'll spend a whole day on this later on, but basically what's going to happen is NADH and FADH2 are going to provide electrons into the electron transport chain. So they started out, and then those electrons get transported down a chain of different carriers. And the electrons eventually end up on oxygen. So the electrons are coming from NADH and FADH2. They're traveling through this system. They're eventually ending up on oxygen. That's how we consume it. Actually, we should write this a little bit differently. We're going to say oxygen comes into the system. And then the electrons hop onto oxygen, and we end up producing water. So for every one oxygen that comes in, we have the electrons hopping on it, and we produce two waters. So that's how we input the oxygen that comes in during the electron transport chain. And it's also where we are producing our waters. Another thing that we produce is a proton gradient. And that proton gradient goes through a molecule called ATP synthase. And we have ADP come into the proton gradient, and ATP come out of the proton gradient. And this is where we really get this. We're not really looking too closely at the numbers in this, but this is the ATP synthase and electron transport chain is really where we get a lot of ATP coming out. We get a couple here, a couple here. We get more than 30, or 
somewhere around 30 ATPs coming out of just this step alone. So this is really, at the end, our energy producing step. And so that's how we're performing cell respiration. We have to go through all of these different steps and processes. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next three days. So this is just an overview of this process. Now the way I've drawn this up, what I want to point out is the presence of all the reds and blues. So really critical to this reaction are two different processes. One of them involving ATP, and so we have to understand a little bit about ATP and how it works. And then the other one that involves this conversion from this chemical called NAD plus into NADH. And so we have to understand those two processes and cycles to really understand this idea of cell respiration. So we've learned about ATP before, and we've seen that ATP involves uh, the nitrogenous base adenosine, and then you have This uh, ATP is triphosphate, so we have three phosphates. Okay, so that's a represent representation of ATP. And what we saw in the reaction is that um, in order to make ATP, or ATP has this process where it goes, and we have another form, called ADP, or diphosphate. So this is ADP, and this is ATP. We've also learned that it's the energy, we talk about uh, ATP being the energy currency of the cell, and that forms the energy currency because of the presence of these phosphates all pushed together is a type of chemical spring, if you will. We've got these four negative charges that are all being pushed together in the molecule. They actually want to repel each other, so they're unhappy, which means that this bond right here is very easily broken, and the phosphate can be transferred to other things. And so what happens in a chemical reaction is that the ATP gets converted into ADP, and the phosphate right here gets transferred in that process onto some other kind of substrate or chemical. And so the substrate goes to being a, so we'll write substrate, and then we attach We'll just represent the phosphate as a P with a circle around it. So here's the phosphate coming off, and that's why the phosphate isn't present over here. And this process then is called phosphorylation. And this happens all the time in the body. We're using this phosphate to energize maybe an enzyme, uh, maybe a different type of protein or to power up some kind of substrate to build a chemical molecule. And so phosphorylation is quite common. But then we have ADP, and this is sort of the spent version of ATP. It doesn't have that terminal or third phosphate. And so in cell respiration, then, what we're trying to do is take a phosphate and now add it back to ADP in order to recreate ATP so that we can keep using it. And that's the main goal, is now we're trying to phosphorylate ADP instead of some kind of substrate so that we can remake our ATP. And that's the process, or the main focus of cell respiration is to eventually be able to make or remake ATP. Uh, so that's 
that's sort of the phosphorylation cycle. We're going to make it here. I guess the one other step, you have phosphorylation. You have the substrate can actually lose that phosphate. So the phosphate comes off as just a naked phosphate, and we call that dephosphorylation. And that's how we get the phosphate right here, kind of come back and add back to ATP. So there's some constant recycling going on with this pathway. And that's the phosphorylation cycle. So starting out, we have this molecule called NAD+. Okay, NAD+ stands for nicotinic adenine dinucleotide, and so that's a lot. It's actually a dinucleotide of adenine, and then this nicotinamide as a nitrogenous base. I'm not going to draw the whole structure. But NAD+, the business end of the molecule, is a carbon, six-membered carbon ring like that, has uh, amide group on it. You guys have learned about that. This ring has a couple of double bonds. It has an H up there. Has a nitrogen right down here at the bottom position. That nitrogen is attached to a bunch of other stuff. And then it has a positive charge on it, which is why it's called NAD+. So this is actually the nicotinamide ring. That's the N, is that structure. And that's the business end of the molecule. And what NAD+, is able to do, you can see it has a positive charge on it. And what it does is it accepts electrons. And so it will hold on to electrons. So we can have uh, two actual electrons come into it. And we're also going to take a hydrogen. And we're going to have those. These are going to come from somewhere. We'll show you later where they come from. And then we form NADH. So NADH looks a little bit different. Still has the six-membered ring structure, the nicotinamide ring. But now, we're going to take that H and one of the electrons, and we're going to add it to this position. So this is going to be new. So one of them gets added right there. And then the other electron, remember there's two of them. The other electron gets added onto that nitrogen right here. So it no longer has a plus charge. And then the double bonds look a little bit different also. And so this is the NADH molecule. Same molecule, it just has uh, some extra electrons and hydrogens on it. And in fact, that H represents the hydrogen that we added right there. So, this is the NAD plus form, and this is the NADH form. And the difference between those two has really been the addition of electrons. So what we've done is we've taken some electrons, and we have stored them onto this chemical ring right here. And that becomes important, because remember we said back over here that we were going to add electrons into the electron transport chain. And that was going to be our power source to eventually burn our oxygen and create our water. And so what NADH is, is really a carrier of electrons. A and that becomes important. We're going to grab electrons from somewhere. We'll talk about that in a second. And then we're going to shuttle those electrons and then pass them off to someone else. So in some ways, the NAD plus and NADH are like an empty taxi cab for electrons and a full taxi cab for electrons. Here we're empty, we're ready to receive those electron passengers, and here we're full, we have the electron passengers, and we're going to take them and dump them off somewhere else. Now, this process, you can see we formed 
and broke some double bonds. This is a chemical reaction, or at least half of a chemical reaction. So we call this, and let's back up here. These two forms have names. They're the same molecule, but in different forms or states. And so over here, for reasons we'll go into later, we call this the oxidase, oxidized form of NAD+, and we call this the reduced form. And it's easiest to understand this word reduced. Reduced means diminished or lowered. And what we're talking about is charge, basically. Over here, because we're adding negative electrons, we've reduced uh, or made more negative or diminished the charge on this overall molecule. It went from being a plus charge to a neutral charge, so we've reduced it. So this is the reduced form. That's where that comes from and why it's called that. And then this one is called the oxidized form. And this type then of reaction is referred to as a reduction reaction. Now, we call this a reduction half reaction. And here's why it's a half reaction. It's not a complete reaction because up here, we just took a couple of electrons and we said, okay, some electrons, they're coming from somewhere. But they actually have to come from somewhere. So there's another half. There's a missing reactant and a missing product here uh, because we have to have some source of electrons. And that source of electrons can be variable. The source of, of electrons then is going to be what we call an oxidation reaction. And that's where we get this oxidation and reduction. The electrons have to come from somewhere, and they're going to come from some kind of oxidation uh, half reaction. So anywhere that we see a reduction reaction, we have to have a complementary oxidation reaction to provide those electrons for us. Now, what are some examples of some oxidation reactions? Well, one example of an oxidation reaction is if we take carbon, let's say we take a molecule of methane, and we produce a molecule of methanol. So we'll put H, 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 and then we add an oxygen to it. Now what we've done quite literally is this one did not have an oxygen, this one did have an oxygen. So we've literally oxidized it. <laughs> we have added an oxygen to it. Um, and that actually uh, produces uh, electrons for us that we could then transfer off. So this reaction is going to be an oxidation and we'll get some electrons that we can move for it. Another, the next step in this is to go from one bond of oxygen to Two bonds with oxygen. And so this is another oxidation reaction. And then yet another one, two bonds of oxygen. We could also go to three bonds of oxygen. So that's another oxidation reaction. And the fullest form, if we have carbon and four bonds to oxygen, now we have carbon dioxide. And this is the most oxidized we can get. So all of these are examples of oxidation reactions. So in summary, uh, NAD plus moving to NADH is a reduction reaction.
where we're receiving electrons from something and then those electrons are being placed on here and they'll be shuttled, that's reduction. The reaction that produces the source of those electrons is our oxidation reaction. And so oxidation and reduction reactions always occur in pairs. When we come back over here to our chart and we see that we've got some reduction. We've got NAD plus going to NADH, so that's a reduction reaction. And somewhere in this process then of glucose going to pyruvate, we have a step that is an oxidation reaction where we're giving up those electrons and then those electrons are being stored on NADH and then those are shuttled somewhere. Same thing happening right here. We've got a reduction reaction happening. Therefore, in pyruvate transport, there must be some kind of oxidation reaction. They always have to occur in pairs. And then in citric acid cycle, we must have a lot of oxidation reactions because we're seeing a lot of reduction reactions. And that's what we want to teach you about uh, how to observe and find some of those. So we were learning uh, using NADH and NAD plus as an example of a reduction reaction. More generally, we can say the following. When you have an oxidation reaction, then we are going to have what they say oxidation is loss of electrons. And that's the definition of an oxidation half reaction. Something is going to be losing electrons. So you're going to have some kind of chemical. It's going to be losing electrons coming off of it. And so then you have, it's now lost electrons. And now you have whatever the product is. And we would say that this is the re reduced form of the reactant. This is the oxidized product because it lost electrons. Someone then gains electrons also. These electrons have to go somewhere. They can't just hang out uh, somewhere. So you have some other chemical and it now has to gain those electrons So this is the chemical B product and because it gained electrons this would now be the reduced product this is the oxidized product and this would be the oxidized reactant okay so they're kind of occur occurring in pairs the electro electrons being lost here and electrons being gained here. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. So this right here, this half reaction, this is our oxidation. That's the loss. We're giving up electrons in that reaction. This reaction is the gain of electrons. And here the product is gaining the electrons. And so that's the reduction. And the way to remember that is to say there's a simple mnemonic device that's usually used in chemistry, and that is oil rig, where oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. And then as we said before, those are always occurring in pairs. And that's where you have oxidation reduction reactions. So this is kind of the overall general strategy or model. So now let's look at what this looks like in an actual chemical reaction. Don't worry about the structure too much. We'll learn these later, but this will introduce you to them. In the citric acid cycle, there is a uh, reaction where we take a molecule called malate, 
And then we are going to convert it into, into to the hydrogens here. And malate then gets converted into another chemical. called oxaloacetate. All right. And so my question to you to look at, and you can pause the video and look at these structures for a second, is, uh, is this one, this is a half reaction. It's not the complete reaction. It's a half reaction. And the question is, is this an oxidation or is it a reduction? And how would you tell? Well, the first thing I'm going to look at to answer this question is what's changing in the two structures? And this is a skill that we want you to learn. We're going through all these chemical reactions. We are going to be looking at the chemical structures of some of them. We want you to be able to notice and compare and contrast chemical structures. We've talked to you about that in past lectures. So as you look at these two molecules, the first question you have to ask yourself is what's happening in this reaction? How does the reactant differ from the product? And so hopefully as you look at and compare these structures, I guess we forgot a negative charge, but when you look at them right to left, you're seeing that this first carbon, nothing's really happening to it. It's a carboxyl group in both cases. The second carbon right here has two hydrogens on it. Two hydrogens on the second carbon. Nothing's happening there. Over here, we've got a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen. And then over here, we've got a carbonyl group. And so that's something different. So that part of the molecule is what has changed in our chemical reaction. And then we see that the last carbon in both cases is a carboxyl group. And so now we look at this and say, what has happened at this carbon and has it been, is this molecule, the product, has it been oxidized or has it been reduced? Did it lose electrons or did it gain electrons? And ultimately, sort of what's happened in this reaction, a, a key trick, so maybe we won't go into the exact reaction dynamics. I'm just going to give you a quick uh, trick that will work for a lot of these different types of reactions, and then we'll see. The key point here is if I look at this carbon, the question I ask myself is, has it gained bonds with oxygen? Remember, oxidized. It's not always the case that it gains bonds with oxygen, but that's a quick way to, to determine if it has gained them, then it has been oxidized. And if it's lost them, then it's been reduced. So here I have one bond to oxygen. And here I have two bonds to oxygen. So I've gained bonds to oxygen, therefore I've been oxidized. So right here, then this is the oxidized product. And we would say that this is an oxidation reaction. Okay? And we actually did lose some electrons here. So you can think of it as what really happened. You've got to redraw this a little bit. And instead of showing the bonds, let's show some electron pairs here. What's really happening in this reaction is that this hydrogen actually comes off and forms an H plus over here. And so that goes away. We have this unbonded pair of electrons, and those electrons hop down, and that's what forms the double bond right there. Is this pair of hydrogen didn't pull its electrons with it, 
We've seen it hopping on to other molecules before and leaving the electrons behind. And so that's where the double bond comes from. Once that happens, that leaves carbon with one, two, three, four, five bonds altogether. It doesn't need five bonds. In fact, it doesn't like having five bonds. And so this hydrogen with its two electrons comes off altogether. And we notice then over here, carbon has one, two, three, four bonds. It's happy. And so we've got two things we've got to get rid of. We've got this H plus we have to be worried about. Actually, we're not too worried about that one. But we've got this hydrogen and its two electrons that are coming with it. Where do those go? Those are the electrons that are being lost. Now, you don't have to be able to pick that out in chemical reactions. And most of the things that we're going to see in class, you can just say, well, that carbon has more bonds to oxygen. Therefore, it's been oxidized. But this is our oxidation reaction. The common reduction reaction then we're going to see is just the one that we've always been, that we've been talking about. So the reduction part, where's our reduction reaction? Well, when we need a reduction reaction, we're just going to pull NAD plus and NADH. That's our common go-to. So we're going to take NAD plus. We're going to take this hydrogen and its two electrons. And we're going to add it on. And we're going to create NADH. So this is where the electrons are coming from. And that is our reduction reaction. We're done. So now we have an oxidation reaction. We had some kind of organic molecule that got oxidized. And then NED plus to NEDH is really going to be our most common reduction reaction. We're going to be using that all the time. And so that NEDH is loaded up now with its electron passengers. And those electron passengers are what we are going to dump into the electron transport chain. Ultimately, those electrons are going to flow, and the electrons are going to be used to reduce oxygen and form water. Okay? Another quick trick on reduction reactions, just like oxidation, the oxidized product has more bonds to oxygen, reduction often involves more bonds with hydrogen. So notice right here, we have more bonds with hydrogen. We have an extra hydrogen bond there. And that's an indicator that this would be a reduction reaction. Okay. Ultimately, right here, we can kind of see the same thing with this water. The water, oxygen, uh, is forming the water right here. And this is a reduction reaction. We're being reduced. We're adding electrons to it. Okay, so it's gaining electrons, just like we've said over there. So we're going to see these oxidation reactions occur all over the place. This reaction happens in the Krebs cycle. We'll see it when we study the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle in more detail. And then we'll see reduction reactions happening all over the place. For our final topic of the day on oxidation and reduction reactions, uh, we want to talk about oxidation reduction energetics. Remember, oxidation and reduction reactions are, are types of chemical reactions. And so they have a delta G associated with them. And that delta G can be calculated. And we're going to teach you how, based upon uh, something called a uh, reduction potential, you can calculate the delta G. What makes oxidation reduction reactions happen, what drives them, is that one of the products has a greater desire for the electrons than the other product. And so it actually pulls like a vacuum those electrons onto itself because it has a greater uh, potential or draw. We, earlier in the class, we learned it sort of as electronegativity. And we said different things have different electronegativities. As a simple example, we said that if you have sodium, and you add chlorine to it, elements, that chlorine has a really strong draw, and it will pull the electron over and form a negative charge. And then the sodium will lose the electron. And so that actually is a type of oxidation and reduction reaction.
Over here, the reduction reaction is this right here. That's our reduction. Because remember, we have a gain in electrons. That's our half reaction. We've gained an electron. And then the sodium, during the course of the reaction, has actually lost an electron. And so it's the oxidation half. And so we can actually, for any given half reaction, we can calculate how much, for example, the chlorine wants an electron and put a value on it. Now, you guys don't have to be able to figure out those values. You look them up in a chart. And that's what we've written up here. So to get you used to this, this is a half reaction chart of reduction potentials. So here are various half reactions. And you can always identify a half reaction because it will have an electron in it, just a free electron hanging out. That doesn't exist in normal nature. This is just a concept. Uh, and so this would be a half reaction. These are all reduction reactions. Uh, and over here, this number, this value E, that we have, that's called the reduction potential. So it's an electrical term. And so we can use a table like this uh, to calculate the energetics or the delta G, which you guys just learned about, for any given reaction. So here we have the half reaction, but we can combine these to make a full reaction and then calculate the delta G for that reaction. Now a little bit, these weren't drawn up here randomly. All of these are components or half reactions that take place in the electron transport chain. Okay, And they're ranked up here somewhat in order. So we know that uh, from our previous drawing, we saw that uh, NAD plus, or really NADH, was coming into the electron transport chain. Here's oxygen and water. We saw that reaction. And then in here are a whole bunch of different intermediates that you're going to learn about. Even though you don't know them now, don't panic. But you'll learn about something called ubiquinone, and there's a complex 3, and there's a cytochrome C, and a complex 4, and then oxygen. So these are all just different steps in the electron transport chain, intermediates that we'll go through. And we can combine these, and I'm going to show you how to combine them, in order to determine a delta G for any reaction. So let's start out with the reaction. Um, we know that overall, the electron transport chain, we said, takes in NADH. And then we also know that it adds oxygen to it. And we have a chemical reaction. And we produce NAD plus and water. Now the question is, does that reaction happen? Does it have a positive delta G? Does it have a negative delta G? And how much? We can use this chart with this formula up here in blue to calculate what the energetics or the delta G of that reaction is. So the first step that we do use in doing that is we have to identify two half reactions that we can then combine to make a full reaction. So we have to identify the right two half reactions. So I have to find two half reactions in my list that have my right products and reactants. Well, that's not too hard. I've got oxygen up here, and I've got oxygen right there. So that's one of the half reactions. And then I've got NADH and NAT plus right here. That's going to be the other half reaction. So that's the first step, is just to identify the two half reactions that I need. The next step is, in a chart like this, they're always written up as reduction reactions. 
So one of them, remember, anytime I have a full reaction, I have to have both a reduction and an oxidation reaction. But I only have or reduction reactions, and so that's going to be kind of tricky. But here's how you work, how it works. I am going to flip one of the reactions to create my oxidation half reaction. So, how does that work? And, and how do I determine which one? Well, I've got to look at my products and reactants of the whole thing and then flip it so that when it adds up, I get them in the right categories. So when I look over here, I've got oxygen on the reactant side, water on the product side, oxygen and water. So that one's in the right orientation. So I can write that first one just up and say one half. O2 plus 2H plus plus 2 electrons gives me water. So that's perfect already. It's already set up. The next one, though, NAD plus, if I write it in this form, then I'll end up with NAD plus on the reactant side, but that won't match the NADH in my full reaction. So that's the one I have to switch. And I'm just going to switch the whole reaction. Here's the key. I can do that. That's perfectly legal to do. We can make any oxidation reaction or reduction reaction when it's flipped or reversed. Then we get a, uh, sorry, let me start over. When we take a reduction reaction and flip it, it turns into an oxidation reaction. So. I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to say NADH plus, or just arrow, gives me NAD plus, plus H plus, plus two electrons, and I'm good. Now, there is one trick to that, and that has to do with the reduction potential. The reduction potential is calculated for the reduction. So if I flip the equation, then I have to change the sign of the reduction potential. And that becomes important because we're going to need this thing called the change in, electric, uh, in reduction potential. So over here, I didn't flip this one. The reduction potential is 0 0.816 for this half reaction. Over here, I have to reverse this one. So instead of a negative 0 0.32, I get a 0, 0.320. Okay? And then, this actually doesn't become delta. This is the sum of. So now I just add everything together. I add the whole reaction together. So now I get uh, NADH plus one half O2 plus over here I've got a hydrogen H plus there. I've got two H pluses there. They kind of, at least the two cross cancels with that. So I get just one H plus. And the electrons are going to do the same thing. I've got two electrons on the left side of the formula, and I've got two electrons on the right side. The electrons should always cross cancel with each other when you do this type of addition. If they're not, you did something wrong. So the electrons cross cancel, two and two. That's good. And now I just add my products. I've got any D plus. Plus H2O. That looks like what I was intending to get all along. I added the two blue reactions. I now have to add the two reduction potentials. So I just get 6, 3, 1.136. And that's the sum of my two reduction potentials. Now,
I have the sum of my two reduction potentials. I have a full reaction, and I have the reduction potential for that full reaction. Now all I have to do is calculate delta G from that. And I just have this. It's not a very difficult formula. Let's come, because we're running out of room on this side, let's come over here and rewrite that formula. Delta G equals negative N F sum of my reduction potentials. What's N? N is equal to the number of electrons being transferred. In this reaction, it's the number of electrons I crossed out, which was two. So in this one, in this example, it equals two. Capital F equals the Faraday constant. And this would be given to you in any formula, and that equals 96.5 believe it's kilojoules, kilojoules per volt, per volt mole. And my reduction potential, that's what we calculated over here by adding those two equations together. So that is 1.136. And then we just calculate delta G from that. Then it's just multiplication. So I have a negative 1 point, or negative 2 times 96.5 times 1.136. 1.136. And I don't have my calculator here, so I'm just going to kind of estimate a little bit here. I've got two. We're going to say this is roughly 100, and this is roughly 1.1. And so I'm going to get about 220 kilojoules per mole. Units right here are volts. The volts cross cancel. And, in fact, let me make sure I have that right. Yeah. Kilojoules per volt mole. The volts cross cancel and I get kilojoules per mole. And that's roughly, that's an estimation, but that's roughly the answer. So this is the amount of energy released when I combine NADH and O2 together, if I were to burn NADH2 with, or NADH with oxygen directly, I would produce about 220 kilojoules per mole, which is actually quite energetic. Uh, we get a, a big release of energy. Oh, we forgot this negative sign. Don't forget the negative sign because delta G is negative. It's exergonic and actually quite exergonic uh, and produces a lot of energy. So we've done seen just from this simple calculation that going from NADH to oxygen to make water is a very energetic process, and we're going to use this to make ATP. Okay, and, and that's the basis of doing this. You can calculate each one of these steps, see whether it has a positive or negative delta G, and how big that negative delta G is. So to review, we identified the two half reactions. We flipped one of the reactions to create an oxidation reaction. We then are going to add the half reactions and add reduction potentials. I guess we need to, in step two, go back and say, we'll say 2B right here. We need to flip or invert invert the sign 
of reduction potential. So we add the reduction potentials, and then we plug the new, the reduction sum, into our formula and calculate delta G. And so that's how we're going to use a half reaction table to calculate the delta G of really any reduction, oxidation reduction reaction for which we have the half reaction and reduction potentials for. And so we're going to wrap up with our exploration of oxidation and reduction there. Next time we'll be talking, really diving into glycolysis and looking at the different steps and what happens in glycolysis biochemically.